are in listen only mode. Good morning, uh, everybody in Europe. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody in China. Welcome to our USME Center webinar series. Uh, today we will talk about funding options uh, small and medium-sized enterprises have when coming to the Chinese market. My name is Budmila Hiklova and I am legal expert in the USME uh, Center uh, here in uh, Beijing. I believe that many of you are already familiar with uh, the platform and with the USME Center. However, for those who are new, please uh, allow me to remind that on the right side of your, of your screen, you have a panel where you can ask uh, any question uh, directly to the topic or even to the USME Center, and we will address your question at the end uh, of, this, of this seminar. Before we move directly to the today's topic, let me shortly introduce USME Center and our services. We are a project funded by the European Union and uh, our main uh, purpose is to help small and medium-sized enterprises from Europe to come to China, either to invest or export their products or uh, services. We provide uh, free confidential information and we cover four areas business development, legal and tax, standards and conformity, HR and training. Our services are provided in the form of information and advice. We reply on the inquiries via email or the, or the phone. We do as well the face-to-face -face consultations. We publish a number of publications. We do trainings, webinars as this one. We as well have a few databases like service providers database, which is basically directory of the law firms, accounting uh, yeah. companies, tax advisors, and many others. We have database uh, of the 40 basic laws in China, and as well updated a database of international fairs and uh, exhibitions. We as well provide additional supporting services like hot desking, so in case you have a business trip to China, you can spend some time in our uh, office next to the Lufthansa Center and you will have free uh, connection to the internet, phone, and as well we are sitting together uh, with you in the same office so you can ask any question you might have. We do uh, as well the briefings to the delegations and uh, matchmaking and networking. I mentioned at the beginning publications. So far we have issued more than 80 publications which cover um, a number of uh, sectors. We, uh, we publish as well the horizontal guidelines, how to establish a company, how to calculate the tax, uh, case studies of the companies who succeeded uh, with their business in China. We have inter interactive infographics as well, uh, you can download uh, all our webinar recordings from our websites. Here are our websites, and uh, there is only one condition uh, which we ask, and it is uh, registration. Then uh, we will know that you are a small and medium-sized enterprise from the Europe, and then uh, we, it is within our mandate to provide services to you. Now to our today's topic, which is foreign investment financing in uh, China. Financing for small and medium-sized enterprises is challenged uh, globally due to the nature of, uh, of their business or of their size. And uh, as well, due to the financial needs, like they need small amounts uh, more frequently and more urgently. Financing the business in China is even more challenging uh, for SMEs because they need to take into account other challenges like, for example, foreign exchange uh, control. Today, uh, for today's topic, we have invited a very experienced um, speaker. It's Mr. Stephen de Preter. Uh, Mr. de Preter is a Belgian citizen and he has spent the last 14 years of his career in Asia, of which 12 in China. He has a large uh, experience uh, of setting up uh, presence of the management consulting firm in Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Singapore offices. 
His main focus at the time was on China-related operational issues, ranging from large startups involving thousands of people, and as well uh, large structures of recently acquired Chinese state-owned enterprises. Mr. De Bretre, in 2008, founded Safir Group Asia, which is a consulting firm cons focused on mergers and uh, acquisitions. So uh, now I will give uh, the floor to our today's speaker. Warmly welcome. Thank you very much for your introduction and good morning to the participants in Europe and good afternoon to those in China. Um, this afternoon um, we'll discuss uh, four topics. First we'll talk a little bit about the key funding types and the different options available in China uh, where we will also discuss um, the registered capital which is quite particular uh, to China. We'll also talk about the Chinese bank system, banking system and the challenges they normally pose uh, to small SMEs uh, who are looking for finance. Um, we will also discuss uh, supply chain financing, which is quite an interesting tool uh, for SMEs. Then we'll also talk about China's foreign exchange control and new regulations that help uh, SMEs to, to work uh, with RMB in China. And then at the end, we'll talk a bit about private equity and the different kinds of private equity and which of these forms may be of interest to uh, SMEs. So first we'll talk about um, the different forms of financing. Um, obviously, uh, whilst a company grows, um, it has different financing needs. Um, in the very beginning, in the early stages when a company is first started, um, the financing normally comes from the founders, from friends and family, um, until it reaches a certain stage. Um, once it reaches a certain stage, then friends and family aren't, don't have enough money anymore to actually finance a, a rapidly growing business. And then, of course, uh, a company needs to look at external financing. Um, if a company is larger, um, it can consider an IPO um, or public debt or look at private equity. Um, when a company is still a small or a medium-sized company, um, the financing tool of choice is normally a bank loan. Before I talk a little bit more about bank loans and the issues and challenges to get them in China, I would first spend a, a very brief moment on um, uh, direct funding options, uh, especially IPOs and public debt uh, uh, issuings. There's a lot of talk about IPOs and uh, we, we see it on the news all the time, but for a company these are actually very difficult uh, transactions. Uh, and for most uh, SMEs these aren't really a viable option uh, because they have very high entry barriers, um, they're very expensive, um, and for most companies it's very difficult to, um, to actually go down that path. Hence, for I think for most of the participants, I think Bank loans um, are still the, the easiest and most frequently used channel of actually financing a company. Now, particular to China, um, there is the um, registered capital, which, if I can, yes, um, we have the registered capital. Yeah, and for, for this part, because there is a custom that during our webinar we have a few polls to know your opinion and uh, your, your views. So the first poll we have uh, today is um, about registered uh, capital. So let me first launch um, our first question. And the question is, how long does it usually take to increase the registered capital and the total investment? And we we give you option, three options. First one is about three weeks, then one and a half months or three months. When I'm talking about uh, increased registered capital, I mean from the moment you apply uh, for the increase till the moment you can effectively use your money from the capital account. So I can see that your voice, uh, that your votes are coming. So I give you a few more seconds. Okay, so let me close it and share with you the results. So almost uh, half of you, 38%, thinks 
that uh, increase of the registered capital lasts three months. Then followed by 36% about one and a half months and only 16% of you thinks it's only it lasts uh, three weeks. Basically uh, those who are saying uh, second and third options are right. Usually it takes between one and a half to three months. It depends how uh, many mistakes you do or you don't do uh, during the preparation of your applications and materials. But this shows that you need to plan uh, needs of, of your financial, I mean your financial needs are very well uh, in advance. So I close the polls and uh, we continue with our presentation. Yeah. And I think also for the people who were, who were hopeful that things could be done in three weeks in China, I, I would say nothing is fast in China and nothing is easy in China. So that's some advice as well. Now going back to the registered capital, it's um, registered capital is actually a um, very important uh, topic in China. Um, because depending on the registered capital, um, that's the, the credibility a company has in China. For example, large Chinese companies and state-owned enterprises, they will not work with a company that has a small registered cap uh, uh, capital. Also, banks will look at the registered capital of a company uh, to judge its credit worthiness. And so it's very important that people think about what will the registered capital be. Now, registered capital and total investments are two very different uh, items. Um, the total investment is really just a number that appears in, in, uh, in, in, in the articles of, of association. Um, and it's not necessarily the actual amount that will be physically invested in a venture in China. However, the registered capital is the actual amount of money that must, by law, be invested in the business in China. Now, the way it works is um, once a company has, its, uh, has received its business license, it has two years to actually transfer the money into the registered capital. The first 15% has to be done within the first three months. Uh, but then it has um, another, you know, another uh, year and nine months to actually uh, uh, pay the rest. Quite interesting is that it doesn't all have to be cash. Uh, up to 70% of the money can be either tangible or intangible assets such as patents or brands or production methods. Anything can be used as long as it can be assessed and valued by a Chinese uh, valuation company. Now, Depending on the kind of company and uh, the kind of industry uh, the, the, a company is active in, the registered capital is determined by the Chinese government and in particular uh, the Ministry of Commerce. And so it's important to, to, to look into uh, what the requirements are from the government to see what exactly your registered capital has to be. Another important uh, item of, uh, where registered capital plays a role is a Chinese entity or a Chinese foreign invested uh, enterprise is allowed to uh, do foreign exchange loans. However, uh, a foreign invested enterprise is only allowed to borrow money from outside China up to the maximum amount of its registered capital. So these things need to be thought through as well before a company starts operating um, to decide how much uh, or how high the registered capital should be. Now, moving on to the, the Chinese banking system, um, there are a number of different types of banks in China. Um, obviously, the policy banks and the rural financial institutes are not really of interest to European SMEs. The large commercial banks, such as ICBC, Bank of China, and all the, the big banks that everybody has heard of, are actually not that interesting for SMEs either. And those banks, they normally service either large state-owned enterprises or large multinationals. The companies that are really of interest to SMEs are either the joint stock companies, which are normally private banks, and the city commercial banks. Now, most cities have their own commercial banks and it's very important for an SME to have a good relationship with those banks because they are the companies who actually finance the economy in a particular area. Um, also, if an SME is active in anything that is vaguely related to agriculture, then it's worthwhile to have a relationship with a rural commercial bank because those banks are used 
to fund anything uh, related to the, the agricultural uh, part of the economy. Uh, Stefan, I have a question. Hmm. There are a lot of news in uh, TV and the newspapers here in China that the Chinese government uh, provides a lot of support to small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, the question is, uh, does, it, does this support mean, um, I mean, it's available to foreign invested enterprises, even SMEs here in China, or is it only for the Chinese invested SMEs? Uh, it's, uh, it's a very interesting question, and I think what we need to understand is that the Chinese central government, they provide the guidelines and the principles, but the financing is actually done on a local level, either at a city level or a provincial level. Now, these local banks and these local governments, they don't mind who, I, who they actually fund, um, as long as they create jobs, as long as they pay revenue. And just to give you an example, um, one of our clients in Tianjin um, has just received the award as the best taxpayer in Tianjin. They're not the biggest company in Tianjin, but they're the best taxpayer. And so the local government really supports them, even though they're a foreign company, because they add so much value to, uh, to the local government. So as long as a company adds value to the city or to the region, local banks will support it. And hence, it's actually very important to have good relationships with the local government, with the local banks, so that they know who you are and that they know what you're doing for them in that particular region. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so if we look at the, um, uh, how the banks actually uh, support local uh, growth and local financing, it's mainly through bank loans. Now, bank loans, obviously, uh, they have a lot of advantages for, uh, for banks. It's very easy to organize because it's, you talk with, you know, the banks talk with the SMEs, the SMEs talk directly with the banks. Um, everything is very transparent. Uh, everything is very transparent because you know what the tax rate will be. You know what the uh, uh, sorry the interest rate will be. You know what the uh, the terms and conditions will be. And for a company, it's obviously interesting to to borrow money uh, because there's a tax benefit involved with your tax shield. Um, however, whilst you know, SMEs need a lot of uh, financing and are uh, are definitely demanding party. Um, banks don't actually offer a lot of loans to SMEs easily. Um, the key reason is that the banks, uh, when they look at the uh, SMEs, they suffer from what we call asymmetric information and high transaction costs. Now, what that means is, if you look at what we, uh, what we call the asymmetric information, it's for a bank to assess an SME, um, they need to look at its finances. Um, and also at its, uh, the, the, the pledges that they have. Yeah. And to this point, uh, to the pledges, we have um, our second poll. And uh, give me a few seconds to, to launch it. And uh, the poll, or the question for the poll is, when negotiating a pledge for a loan, which asset can you use? And the option is inventory, of raw materials, patents, or you can use both A on B as a pledge. So please give your opinion. And your, your votes are coming. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting because I was uh, myself wondering of the, uh, what, what, what answer is, is, the, is the correct. Okay. So uh, I finish, I close the polls and share the results with you. So 11% of you uh, thinks that inventory of raw materials is enough, 29% uh, votes for the patents, and the rest of you, 61%, uh, thinks that uh, you can use both uh, inventory of raw materials and, as the patent of the pledge. So. Stefan, what is, what is the right answer? 61% um, of the people is correct because you can use both uh, inventories of raw materials as well as patents uh, as a pledge. Now, the patents is actually something quite recent because if you look at um, what the Chinese government is doing is they understand these issues that banks have. So if you look at an SME, they don't have the same reporting as a... Um, as a big listed uh, company. 
Now, if you look at the, the pledges an SME has, um, typically a European company, they don't buy land in China or they don't necessarily own the, uh, uh, the factories, they just rent them. Whilst if you compare that with a, uh, with a Chinese company, they normally own uh, the land and so they can borrow against uh, the land and, and the buildings that they own. So for European companies it's harder, so Chinese government is actually making it easier to use different kinds of, of, of issues or of, of pledges um, to use to, to get financing. One of the issues obviously is how do you value these pledges, um, but that's something that the government is also working on. Another issue that SMEs um, or that banks have with SMEs is that the typical SME isn't very, very strong at planning a couple of years ahead with its financing needs. And also for a big, uh, for a big bank to look at a very small company, they don't know the company and they don't know if this is a good company or not. Then if you look at the transaction costs involved, for a bank to approve a loan uh, of 100 million uh, euros or 1 million euro, it's more or less the same amount of time and the same amount of, of, of cost for them. So they're, they're more interested in uh, doing big loans. The amount of time they have to invest in getting to know a company and understanding its business is also the same um, to, for a big company as for a small uh, company. So again, uh, banks are more interested in working with big companies as opposed to uh, small companies. Obviously, a small company that you don't know has high risk and all of that results in either limited loans or loans with higher interests uh, for SMEs. Now, how, has the, how is the Chinese government dealing with this is um, they're looking at certain solutions. Um, yeah, so to deal with the asymmetric uh, information, we basically you know government is, look, is using different ways to value pledges, value companies. Um, also, more and more soft information is taken into account um, and they're organizing different um, angles to look at an SME and one of them we will discuss in more detail. Then also from a regulatory point of view, um, government is forcing banks to set up dedicated uh, SME teams um, and is actually giving uh, banks hard targets that they have to hit of certain sums of money that they have to loan to, uh, to the SME sector in China. Also, from a risk uh, point of view, government is willing to take some of the risk that banks have to take um, borrowing money uh, or lending money to, to SMEs um, so that banks would actually have an easier time to, to approve these loans. So, all of these things um, the, the government is doing um, to, actually, you know, to actually make uh, SME financing easier in China. Of course, Government can do part, um, but SMEs need to do uh, yeah, their part as well, and that's really focused on the asymmetric uh, information. It's making sure you have proper reporting systems in place, making sure you can actually educate your your, your, fin uh, your finance institution as who you are, what you do, and what your business, how profitable your business is, and why you need the money. If you can provide them all the information, banks will you know will, will find it much easier to work with you than uh, if they have to figure it all out themselves. Then, if you look at the, um, and this is a, there's a lot of information on this slide, but I would like to, I would like to, to point everybody's attention at the, the column on the right, current bank solutions. If you look there, that's an example of what, uh, what the government is doing to, to provide solutions to provide loans to, uh, uh, to, uh, to SMEs. Um, as opposed to in the past, they only looked at the financial results, but now what they, they do, what they call three qualities and three sheets. Um, the three qualities are the quality of the owner, the entrepreneur, they actually see who is this person, can we trust this person, do we have a good relationship with this person. Um, they look at the product and they look at the pledges. Then they also look at three sheets, um, the electricity bill, the water bill and the customs declaration. Because these are, uh, these are actually documents that you can't easily cheat with. Um, if you have a high electricity bill, if you have a, a high water bill, you're obviously producing, you're obviously manufacturing something, you obviously have a working business. Um, and so judging by, you know, the, by your utilities bill, banks in China will actually say, okay, well, this, this business, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's actually working, it's a working business, they're producing, uh, we can actually finance this. 
Then uh, I would also like to highlight here that uh, one of the new financing techniques that the government is working on is supply chain financing. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a, uh, in a minute. Because it's actually quite interesting and I'm not sure if it exists in many other, uh, in many other countries in China. Now, what this supply chain financing is in the traditional financing, um, what happens is the bank looks at the company and they only take into account what that particular company does. What happens in supply chain financing is they look at the whole value chain a particular company is uh, involved in. And not only do they look at the particular uh, characteristics of a particular company, but they look at who is it actually working with. If you are a European SME and you're trading with one of the big Chinese uh, SOEs and you have a stable relationship with them, then obviously a bank will know, well, they will know the Chinese, uh, they will know the big Chinese company. They will know that if you supply to them and you have a stable relationship with them, that you, are, you will be a trusted uh, partner for them as well. Now, this is something that the Chinese government and the Chinese banks are really pushing and that is growing much faster compared to other more traditional financing ways. Um, it's particularly useful for uh, industries who are in food and beverages, uh, pharmaceuticals, manufacturing, automotive and retail. Because there you have a lot of uh, very long value chains where you can actually really see which company does what. And you can really, a bank can really support that whole value chain. Now, supply chain uh, financing products are focused on three different types. Um, first, you have the inventory, which is very similar to traditional uh, financing. But then you also have the prepayments and receivable parts, which is where the banks really work together with the other companies in the value chain. Yeah, Stephen, I have uh, another question from, from outside, like question. Uh, in this supply chain financing, is there any space for a company which is registered uh, in a foreign country in Europe? Um, I mean, simply, can the foreign uh, company benefit from this supply chain financing? Ah, absolutely. Um, it doesn't really matter um, which, na which nationality the company has, as long as the, co the legal entity is in China. Because the financial institute or the bank needs to be able to understand the supply chain, needs to be able to, to, to know which business is doing what. Um, if the organization is outside China, you don't give the bank uh, the opportunity to get to know your business properly because they, they don't understand what is happening in, uh, outside China. They, you know, they don't have a team outside China. So any company who is active in China with an existing organization in China can actually be part um, of, of a supply chain financing um, value stream of a bank. Okay, so, so, so it means I need to have a company in, in China. Mm -hmm. yeah. Correct, yes. Now, we can actually show how it happened in the past, how it happens now. And I can also explain why banks are very keen to actually do supply chain um, uh, financing. In the past, you had a particular key company um, who was normally very large, who had a very good relationship with a, with a particular bank. Then its suppliers had a different relationship with another bank. Um, and its customers, either the retailers or, uh, or whichever, um, also had a different relationship with, with, with other banks. Now, for a bank, the benefit is very clear because if they go upstream and downstream with their financing work, they can actually, based on a, on, on, on a particular large key company, they can expand their financing efforts um, and their financing business by uh, financing the whole value stream of a key company. The key company, it will be a very big company that they know, that they trust, that they know inside out. And because they know that company so well, they can work with that company to go to the suppliers and the retailers um, to finance those parts of the business as well. And obviously, if the bank can, take, uh, can finance a whole value chain, a value chain, there's a lot of financial benefit for them as well. Now, to show you the impact um, of supply chain financing, um, I would like to give an example in the automotive industry, um, where a um, uh, where a European company uh, worked with a Chinese bank to actually finance distributors. Now, the way it works is the car manufacturer obviously manufactures cars 
and then sells them to its car dealerships throughout China. However, for a distributor or for a car dealership, it's a very large investment to stock these cars because um, they obviously have to pay for them. Now, from a growth point of view, um, these car dealerships, they need a lot of cash um, already before they can actually grow their business because to grow their business, they need more cars. In order to get more cars, they need more money. So it's a bit of a catch-22, which one comes first? Now, what the bank actually did was they had an agreement with the uh, car manufacturer where the car manufacturer selected a number of distributors, um, various distributors, some of them were very large, some of them were, were actually startups. Um, some of these startups weren't even break even yet. Um, and then they provided financing uh, for these companies uh, to actually run their business. The bank was very, was very reassured because they knew um, they had an agreement with the, uh, with, the, with the car manufacturer and they knew their business and they trusted the, the car manufacturer's views on the distributors. What happened then with the uh, distributors, and this is a, a distributor, uh, sorry, car dealership um, that enjoyed supply chain financing after 12, yet, after 12 months, um, was when they first started um, with supply chain financing, they weren't break even yet. Um, they had a, if they wanted to do, if they wanted to get loans, they couldn't do it because no bank wanted to, uh, wanted to lend money to a car dealership that wasn't profitable yet. It was just too risky. Um, they had a not so amazing uh, debt asset ratio uh, for a car dealership of only uh, 56%. However, after 12 months, um, the car dealership could use a lot of financing from, uh, from the bank, could really, uh, could really uh, use that money to invest in stock um, which they could then sell, and as you can see, the before and after uh, picture of, um, of this car dealership is very different. Um, where in the past, as, a, as an independent company, it couldn't get any uh, financing because it wasn't profitable. They could now actually use their better credit rating uh, to get financing outside the supply chain financing as well. And so in 12 months time, it went from a company struggling to grow and struggling to get its financing to a company who was really growing, who was really focusing on how they could expand their business and uh, open additional uh, sales locations as opposed to where they were in the past. So in examples like this, um, the supply chain financing can make a huge difference for uh, small and medium sized companies. Now, in this particular um, example, it's for the Chinese uh, distributor who is working with a, a European uh, car manufacturer. However, there are lots of examples as well where European companies are the beneficiary of the supply chain financing, where they can actually use the, um, the balance sheet essentially of their, uh, of their large partners to get the financing they need in China. Now, we would like to talk a little bit about uh, foreign exchange control in China. Um, because foreign exchange is it's a very difficult uh, item in China because the RMB, even though China is the, the second largest economy in the world now, the RMB, its currency, still is not a freely traded uh, currency. Now, just very briefly, um, this shows you how uh, foreign exchange is actually managed in China. Um, you, have the, um, you have the state administration of foreign exchange and the People's Bank of China who actually work hand in hand to, you know, to, to manage the foreign exchange uh, issues. Um, at the moment, um, anything that has to do with exchanging money, bringing money in, bringing money out um, is very time consuming, is quite, ex is quite expensive and if you don't prepare it well and you don't, you know, you don't foresee and you don't plan how you will manage your business, can create a lot of, can sometimes even create uh, cash flow problems if you can't get your money out. Now, at a local level, um, it's actually the banks uh, who, uh, who manage the foreign exchange. And I would like to use these three examples of how actually um, the banks and the different organizations in China uh, operate to manage and to control what happens with the uh, with the currency. Yeah, I have a, one question um, which is related to the future of, of the RMB. Uh, so, Stephen, how do you see the regulatory environment 
for the future trading in R and B and um, I mean full convertibility. Well, <clears throat> um, if you compare the the evolution of the R and B uh, compared to 10, 15 years ago, it already went through a huge change. Now, the end game. Uh, for the Chinese government undoubtedly is a freely traded uh, currency. However, it will go through different trial and errors to actually see how they can best do it. Um, I think at the moment it's still quite regulated and quite strict, um, but in the next couple of years, I would say in the next three to five years, I think it will definitely become a more freely traded currency. You can already see that the government is doing more currency swaps with a, a lot of uh, various emerging uh, markets to actually allow for RMB trade in those countries. Um, we'll also a little bit in a couple of slides, we'll also talk about um, some tools that the Chinese government is launching to allow non-Chinese companies to operate in, um, uh, in RMB. So I think it's hard to say at which speed things will happen but it is beyond doubt that the RMB will become more, uh, a more freely traded currency. Now, if we look at the different ways that actually you know, that, that the government uh, controls uh, the currency is when a company starts um, uh, organizing a, uh, when, when a company actually uh, is set up in China, um, then first the government actually needs to give you an approval to have a foreign currency account. Now, when you open an account, that's really just an administration. You just need to get a job and a couple of forms, and then you can set up an account. However, to get money into that, into that account from outside China is a lot harder. Um, if you go and uh, yeah, if you if you transfer money um, to a uh, to, to to an entity in China, um, government will will ask you what you need the money for. They will ask for contracts. They will ask for invoices and you really need to prove what you will use the money for. One of the reasons um, that the government is, is so strict at it is um, because the Chinese economy is growing so fast still, even though people talk about a, a, a slump or a slowdown, is Chinese government is very worried about hot money. Um, people who are investing uh, foreign uh, money, exchanging it into RMB, and then buy very speculative uh, asset classes. To avoid that, um, or to try to avoid it at least, Chinese government is very strict at which amounts of money uh, are allowed in and what they're being used for. Um, and so there's a lot of paperwork involved in actually getting the money in. Um, the other way, uh, getting the money out, um, is also not an, an easy uh, issue. Because then you need to show what you, uh, uh, where the money comes from. You need to prove that you need to prove that tax has been paid on that money. And for example, um, if you want to pay a supplier um, for a contract in China, you want to pay, uh, you want to pay them in uh, foreign currency. It can actually take up to three months to go to the whole administration and paper mill to get the approvals you need to exchange your RMBs into foreign currency and exchange those currencies out. And just to give you an idea, you know, you need to translate your contracts, you need to translate your uh, your invoices need to explain what the money is for and so it's quite a, uh, a quite a cumbersome process and very time-consuming process. Um, for individuals as well um, there's a very strict uh, regulation that individuals are only allowed to exchange 50,000 US uh, per annum. Once you have used more than 50,000 US per annum um, and you need more RMBs then you actually need to go to the bank with invoices and prove that you need additional money. So then you can go with uh, restaurant tickets, taxi tickets, invoices to you know to get more RMBs, which uh, is also a very uh, very cumbersome process. Now, one important part, well, one important point is that the whole foreign exchange regulation and the whole foreign exchange regulation, it's set by the national government, by the central government, but it's actually implemented by the various local governments. So that implies or that means that even though uh, you have a national guideline, that particular guideline can be interpreted in different ways by different local governments. And for those companies who have different sites in China, they can actually be, um, they can actually be operating under different foreign exchange rules, 
even though the guiding principle from the central government is the same, but the local implementation uh, is different. And hence, it's important again to, you know, to know how the local government interprets it, uh, what is possible locally and uh, what is not. Um, and all of that information you obviously need to know before you start operating in a particular area um, so that you know how you can actually get the money in and out uh, that you need to run your business there. Now, one of the tools that the Chinese government is providing um, to um, uh, allow foreign companies to operate more easily um, is a non-residential account. A non-residential account, the easiest way to uh, explain it, it's an onshore, offshore account in China. So a foreign company, for example, a company based in Europe, um, is working with uh, uh, trade partners in China. They can actually set up an RMB account these days and use that, uh, use that account to, um, uh, to, to receive RMBs, which wasn't possible in the past. It is a very easy, very cheap way to operate. And government has been running pilots uh, for non-residential accounts since 2010. And it's expected to be launched as a national um, uh, system or a national account in the near future. Now, the non-residential account can also be used um, to avoid currency uh, exposure. Whilst you can actually uh, work with um, uh, non-defendable uh, forwards. And so if you use these products in combination with an, uh, a non-residential account, uh, you can avoid the currency exchange because you can sign contracts with uh, various banks uh, to lock in your exchange rates uh, with the uh, non-residential account. Now, we come to the, to the final chapter um, of, our, uh, of our presentation, and that talks about private equity. Now, private equity has really gone through a very big evolution in China. In, say, the early 2000s, the private equity industry could be measured in the tens of millions, whilst now, in uh, a little bit more than 10 years later, it's an industry that is measured in the tens of billions of dollars that is uh, available in the industry. For those people who aren't uh, familiar yet with uh, private equity, private equity is an, an illiquid asset class, meaning you can't easily sell it. Uh, or private equity funds can't easily uh, get out of the investments they make. They normally stay for about uh, five years and the money comes from any person or any organization who has a lot of uh, available cash, be it pension funds or insurance companies or uh, people with uh, yeah, rich people. Now, private equity, this, it actually, it's a, it's, it's a name for a lot of very uh, very different uh, forms of investment. Um, and the form of investment really depends on the, the amount of money that is required. If you start at the very bottom, um, at the smallest amount of investments, uh, you are looking at angel investment. Angel investment, it's normally um, not so well organized um, form of investment that is normally done by individuals as opposed to uh, an organization. Um, with the rise of, of, of Chinese economic growth and uh, Chinese economic wealth, there's actually a lot of rich individuals these days who are investing relatively small amounts of money in Chinese or foreign companies. Um, there's a lot of angel organizations where these people can be found, where you can make your presentation to, to try to get money. And the amounts really vary from as little as 50,000 euros to 1 million euros uh, or even up depending on the business and the needs. Now, obviously, working with, with, a, with, a, with a private investor um, has some advantages and some disadvantages. I think the key advantages is, are that it's a, it's a very informal way of investing. And so you get the money quickly. There's not too many, there's not too many issues. There's not too much due diligence involved in it. Um, and you don't have to go through a very time-consuming process that takes your attention away from the business. Um, the key disadvantages are that you're actually working with somebody um, and you don't necessarily know these people's agenda. Uh, especially if you take money from, uh, from a rich Chinese person, you don't know how involved they will be. You don't know what they want to do with the, with the business. You don't know if they will actually suddenly start 
visiting your company all the time and tell you what to do and um, start talking to your staff. So before you actually go and start working uh, with an angel investor, it's really very important that you understand what people's personal agenda are and that you really understand who these people are because unfortunately I've seen quite a lot of people who, who actually took money from an angel investor who then end up having a fight um, and started creating a lot of uh, distraction uh, that took them away from actually growing the business. If you go one level up uh, from angel investment, you start looking at venture capital. Venture capital is normally an organized form of investment, um, very often for rapidly growing businesses that need money in, for, to, to reach various milestones. Um, these people are professionals, they help your business, um, they look at the organization, they, um, they sit at your board, they help you actually, you know, they provide a lot of value add as well. The difference between venture capitalists and growth capitalists is basically the size of investment. Um, a growth capital fund, they normally invest in companies who are profitable, who have a, an existing management team, a proven business whilst venture capitalists take a lot more risk. Because they take a lot more risk, also the amounts of money you can expect are uh, smaller. Um, some of the disadvantages um, with the growth capital is that you have a, a professional, strong investor who has acquired a significant minority stake in your business, and so there's a certain loss of autonomy in your business. Um, also because these people need to report to the, their investors, there's a significant amount of reporting uh, that suddenly comes with that kind of money. Um, and because there's reporting, there's also very strict targets. One of the things that very often happens uh, working with private equity funds is that they have what they call a clawback clause, where when you invest, uh, when they invest uh, in your business and they assume a certain value based on certain future targets, if they don't, uh, or if you, if you miss your targets, that they actually can get more shares of your business um, in order to reach the value that they negotiated uh, in the beginning. And so if you're not careful and you're a bit too ambitious with giving them a too rosy picture of your business, you can very easily lose a very uh, significant part of your business without getting additional money. So at this stage, basically, uh, growth capital is... Um, yeah, growth capital is, is a very booming uh, industry. It's actually the largest private equity segment in the market at the moment. Um, and it's very interesting for people who have a strong business and who have a very clear path forward of what they want to achieve with the organization. Now, this brings us towards the end um, of our presentation uh, on how to finance your organization in China. And I would like to, to sum up what we discussed with. There are actually quite a few um, possibilities to finance an SME in China using available tools, available channels uh, that already are in China. I think in the future we can definitely expect um, additional tools and additional channels uh, to be launched and to become available to SMEs. But I think the, the, the four key points that I think any uh, SME needs to take into account is you need to plan your business well, you need to know what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, so that you can plan your financing and know how you're going to make your money and get it out. You need to choose your right financing partners, meaning you need to know, you know, you really need to work with a with a particular finance institute so that they get to know you and that you can you can really educate them on who you are and why you need the money, so that they so that there is a relationship of trust, which is even more important in China than in other countries. Um, and then you really need to understand what is happening in China. Because if you don't know what is available and you don't use it, you might be at a disadvantage. And I would actually like to give to really advise people to have a, a good accountant or a good finance manager who really follows these things and who, you know, who, who educates uh, management in China as well as in Europe uh, as to what is available and what can and cannot be done at the moment. Because it really makes a huge difference uh, for people. So this brings us to the end. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Stefan, mm. uh, for this directly to the point uh, yeah. presentation. 
we have receiving uh, and, uh, many many questions from you and uh, I give a few seconds to, to Stephen to, to uh, prepare answer for them. And I would like to bring to your attention that uh, Stefan as well drafted for us for USME Center guideline on how to fund uh, your business uh, or SME business, European SME business here in China. And this guideline is going to be uh, published during, uh, during the November. So for those who are interested to learn more about the funding, uh, please be uh, informed that there is uh, more is more is coming. Now I give the the floor back to the Stefan. All right, thank you. Um, there's quite a few questions um, from the participants on how a European SME can approach the the Chinese banking system. Um, how do you get inside? Well, I think the the first point um, is you need to choose the right partner. Um, if you go, for example, to Bank of China and uh, you're a small SME, they're simply not going to give you any attention. You might spend three, four, five meetings with them. You spend a lot of time and effort with them, but it's undoubtedly, yeah, it's, it's very unlikely that um, much will come out of it for you. So the first step is you need to know who you should address, uh, which organization you should uh, talk to, and we mentioned that in the slide, uh, which organizations uh, there are. I think the second point is um, you need to build a relationship with 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 with, uh, with your with your counterpart in the in the Chinese bank. Um, you need to you know you need to go local um, with your bank and with your bank manager or the person responsible for uh, who you have to work with, and really make sure that the person knows your knows your organization, but also that the person knows who you are as a person. Um, I'll explain a little bit further. It's um, it's not, you know, I, I'm, I'm definitely not saying that a foreigner should go and, and, and have lots of dinners and do lots of drinking with a, with a finance manager, but you should have a strong accountant or a strong finance manager who actually, on a regular basis, sits down with these people. Um, it doesn't harm to, at the appropriate cultural moment, for example, with Chinese New Year, to provide some gifts and uh, make sure that people know, make sure that people know who you are and what you've been doing and really build a certain rapport and a certain relationship with your people and that will definitely smoothen your, your financing effort with, um, uh, with, fi with Chinese organizations. So I, I hope that that basically answers those questions on how to get in and how to really build a relationship and the relationship building, it's, you know, it's, I, can, I can't stress it enough uh, how important it is for companies to have a strong local finance person in place. It doesn't have to be a senior expensive person, just a, a strong good uh, accountant that can talk to people that know how things work is worth his or her weight uh, in gold actually. Then there are also quite a few questions on um, where people can find uh, Chinese investors and if there's any websites. And uh, to answer those questions, um, there's actually quite a few um, angel investors or organizations in China, and I think if people, when people get a, um, uh, yeah, we can provide people with the with the links of those organizations. Um, on the internet, there's quite a few of them. There's also a venture capital organization in China, uh, which can provide you the um, uh, the details for. And a second area is through networking, um, getting to know people letting people know who you are and that you're looking for money and building up a network uh, in that area. And then you can fairly rapidly find uh, good people who, who are available. Now, there's a, another question um, from people who, um, who ask the three most valuable advices for a novice SME um, to find suitable finance. Um, I think we, we more or less covered that question, um, and I think I would like to repeat the key, the key question is, and the, the key point is really have strong relationships with the right people. Um, sit down with people, um, build relationships, not only when you need them, um, but just on a regular basis when you can actually uh, look at, when you can actually spend some time with people. I think it's important, for example, to have a local person who, who controls the relationship but then on a regular basis, um, whenever a senior person from Europe comes to China, 
just to organize a, a lunch or a dinner or even just a simple coffee um, to pay respect to the people uh, in your financial institute to, you know, to, to sit down with them and to spend some time with them. Not necessarily talk about financing but just to build a personal relationship. Yeah, we are coming to the end of the presentation, so we have a, a few questions remaining. And one of them is, uh, it, it's focus on your experience, Stefan, and uh, the, um, someone is asking, what, they, what are the key mistakes European uh, companies, meaning small companies, make when they operate in uh, China? That's quite a general, but if you can address this, please. Um, <clears throat> I think the um, the number one issue that uh, that European companies face when they actually come to China is that they they set up their business in the wrong way. Um, you can run, you can actually build a very efficient uh, legal organization using the different uh, legal territories in China to build an efficient, tax efficient organization. When people start working in China without thinking things through, um, it's very easy to get stuck um, with difficulties of not being able to, to repatriate their, uh, their profits um, and to, you know, to, 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 to end up with a, with a situation where they basically can't really operate their business anymore because of the way that it has been set up. So I think the number one issue is lack of preparation and lack of understanding of how the business will, will be set up, how it will grow, and what the financing milestones are um, of when what cash is required. And uh, there is uh, really one, one last question. I think that we have probably uh, already addressed it, but still, does supply chain financing work for all SMEs in China? Um, yes and no. Um, a, um, as long as the company is in, as long as the company has a legal entity in China, it should be possible um, to get supply chain financing. The key thing that we need to look at is, does this company or does the uh, SME work with a large organization, preferably a large Chinese organization, where a Chinese bank can actually assess and analyze the whole uh, value chain. If there is a big organization, a key part of a value chain that the Chinese bank can work with and that they can assess, then it's worthwhile to discuss uh, supply chain financing with your bank. If all your clients are very small Chinese companies, it will be very hard because you will, the, the banks will, fame, will face the same issue with you as they will face with the, um, uh, with the Chinese companies, that they're too small to really assess uh, the risk and they're too small to really trust. As a, as a cornerstone uh, to do supply chain financing with. So I think it all, you know, it, it depends on the size of the, the key company in a value chain. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for the presentation and for answering uh, questions of, of our uh, listeners. And now we are really at the end of uh, our presentation on funding opportunities in uh, China. Uh, I would like to bring to your attention uh, or remind you about our websites, so please uh, feel free to uh, visit us on our websites, uh, register, it takes like three minutes and it's free of charge and then you will have access to all publications including uh, the upcoming guideline on uh, financing in uh, China which was uh, written by uh, our today's speaker Stephen de Pretre. And uh, as well you can ask uh, any any question you might have on the funding or any other. So thank you very much for your uh, attention and uh, I look forward to uh, being in contact with you in our next uh, webinar next Tuesday. Thank you very much for your time. Enjoy your day, the rest of your day and the rest of the evening depending on where you are. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.